So I think uh, I'd like to uh, take questions from the audience uh, right away because the time is short and we've covered a lot of ground. So uh, let's start here. Mike. Thank you. My name is Pei Emerson, entrepreneur in education and communication, okay. coming from Sweden. Thank you. I guess there's lots of interest to Stuart Eisenstadt about how the law can be used. Uh, and I want to put the question to you about the United States, because we have a number of issues in Europe when it comes to corruption and money laundering in European companies. And even if those companies only have 0.1% activity in the US, it's being handled by US authorities. US authorities outsource the work to law firms, and then European firms have to pay millions or billions of US dollars. And I don't think they should, they, of course they should pay when they've done mistakes, but what I can't understand is why we haven't got the system within the European community to handle this. Why should it be US jurisdiction that controls the world in this area? Thank you. Maybe we're going to take two or three questions uh, and then we'll, we'll respond. Yes, uh, the, the lady out there. Uh, no, no. Here, I think there was a question. Uh, we'll take three questions. Please be, be brief. Uh, my question is to Mr. Eistad. Um, Dania Khatib from um, Isam Faris uh, Institute at the American University of Beirut. You spoke about the Palestinian and their use of lawfare. Uh, what other option do they have when the Israeli slowly eat up their land and build settlement and there is no international pressure to compel Israel for the two-state solution? What other option do the Palestinians have? Okay, and I also want to tell you that while Barak was negotiating with Arafat, he was bragging that he built settlements more than any other prime minister. Thank you. Thank you. Third question here and then we'll, we'll respond. Hi, uh, I'm Daniel Shek. I'm a former Israeli diplomat. I would love to hear someone expand a little bit about a notion that was mentioned uh, at the beginning of the uh, universal jurisdiction. Um, there is, of course, uh, the one sort which is within the international bodies that have been created and regulated through agreements like the ICC, but there are also individual states which have acquired uh, different levels uh, of uh, universal jurisdiction, which creates a somewhat uncertain and unclear and fluid legal landscape, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, so I wonder if somebody would uh, like to say what, what they think this is worth and is, is it still a useful tool when there are uh, recognized international bodies that have to deal with it? Okay, thank you. We'll uh, take that maybe uh, if we start with the last question. Uh, Antida, do you want to answer this, okay. Professor? Um, universal jurisdiction. I think uh, for some authors, uh, it's a law for a problem because uh, effectively you have individual states who use the universal jurisdiction to uh, uh, fight against a uh, specific individual. Uh, for Pinochet, for example, you have action against Tony Blair uh, as well, uh, from Belgium and so on, and uh, for Brangel and so on. Uh, I don't think so. I think that uh, universal jurisdiction, it's, uh, it's not a lawfare argument because uh, it's based on a uh, universal convention. So it's an obligation for the state who are party to this convention to respect their obligation. And uh, if this convention, this international convention, mentions the universal jurisdiction, they have to. Uh, respect this uh, convention obligation. So I don't think it's lawfare. It's a legitimate use uh, of law uh, and uh, you have this obligation if you are party of, uh, uh, of this convention. So uh, I'm not sure it's... Yeah, local, local, but 
most of the time you have uh, uh, you have an obligation uh, based on international convention even if you uh, if you act as an individual state uh, according to your uh, national uh, law you have an international you can have an international obligation to uh, use uh, universal jurisdiction that's why for me it's uh, uh, it's not lawfare because it doesn't used to destabilize the other parts. It's not, it's only a conventional obligation. Yeah, I think the problem is to draw the limit between the legitimate and the illegitimate use of law between the legal and the illegal use of law. Stuart, Palestinian lawfare and extraterritorial activity as well. I'll answer all three. On the last <laughs> point, uh, it is a use of lawfare. It's an inappropriate use of lawfare. Uh, the Dutch, the British, the Belgians use it as a way of asserting jurisdiction over actors who aren't their citizens and who they say have committed war crimes, including a private corporation that I happen to represent in the Netherlands who had a, a leased business with construction equipment that was used in the West Bank. And he was arrested and uh, he spent three or four years trying to avoid it. Now, with respect to the Palestinians and the question, the first question on uh, the financial situation. Uh, I understand exactly your point on the Palestinians. Let me point out, if I may, and I've been engaged in these negotiations for a very long time in many administrations. At Camp David II, under Clinton, Prime Minister Barack offered 95% of the West Bank East Jerusalem is a capital of a new Palestinian state. 50,000 refugees coming back permanently to Israel. Arafat, who I had negotiated with just two weeks before and who told me, don't have President Clinton invite me to Camp David because I'm not willing to make the compromises he wants. They couldn't give up the law of their so-called right of return. Uh, several years later, Prime Minister Olmer at 96% of the West Bank, East Jerusalem was the capital, 50,000 refugees. Abbas turned it down. And by the way, Arafat created the second intifada uh, when he turned this down. There's no question but that we have a government in Israel that is not predisposed, to say the least, to these kinds of negotiations. But if the Palestinians had had a Martin Luther King, if they had had someone who was willing in a nonviolent way to say, everything is on the table. We are willing to accept, as Oslo, they did, a Jewish state. We want our state, and we're willing to negotiate, as we did not do uh, in Camp David II and uh, in uh, Omer's time, we would have a completely different situation. It would turn the tables, and there wouldn't be a need. They use lawfare because they're not willing, in the end, to make the final decision that they're not going to have a million and a half refugees coming back to Haifa and to Tel Aviv. That sense of With respect to the financial situation, the answer is in one word, the dollar. I mean, the dollar is the king. Uh, you can't do business without the dollar. The euro is not a comparison. Now, having said that, I have to conclude because I, I'm not a defender of all the things we've done. With the war on terror, until the US Supreme Court said we couldn't do it, we had extrajudicial after 9-11 assassinations and abductions. We created in Guantanamo a situation in which to avoid US law, we used torture in order to extract confessions trying to come into a hole saying, well, they're not a US court. The Supreme Court turned that down. We have a president, and uh, my colleague from South Korea, who actually served together in Brussels, nailed it right on the trade issue. But let me go beyond that. How can we have, Michael, an international rule of order when we have a president who has withdrawn from agreements reached by his predecessors, which had never been done before? the Paris Accord, the JCPOA nuclear agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership with 12 countries, uh, 
the, you know, all of these, the INF Treaty with Russia, all of these things have been unilaterally withdrawn from. I mean, you talk about governance, my goodness, how can we urge any kind of rule of law on other countries when we abrogate agreements that previous presidents had reached in good faith? I'll close with one example. Jimmy Carter negotiated the SALT II nuclear agreement. It was never ratified by the Senate for reasons which I mentioned in my book, but it's not relevant here. Reagan took over, polar opposite ideology. He and the Soviets abided by SALT II as if it had been ratified till the last day it was due to expire because he respected what his predecessor had done. Before taking three questions on this side of the room, I'd like just to answer your question a little more specifically, because why aren't the European, why isn't European doing the job? Because until very recently, Europeans did nothing on anti-corruption. In France, bribes were tax deductible until the OECD convention went into force in 2000. And it's only two years ago that we've got a law that the UK also acted, so it's just starting, and it's a good thing. But until now, they left the floor open to, to the US, which has been the anti-corruption policeman of the world. So things are changing, but that's mainly the reason. So there's one question here, two questions, second question here. Go ahead, sir. Alors, ma question s'adresse à Madame Anne Tida. Et euh, le président Bush, après les attentats du 11 septembre, lorsqu'il a traité l'Irak et l'Afghanistan d'État voyou, est-ce qu'on peut considérer ça comme du lawfare Merci. Sure. Question là. Hello, Nadia Moti, University of Mohammed V, professor. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm very curious to know how can the law prevail if the law is here to protect minorities, to protect certain issues worldwide, and you lawyers cannot do something to uh, do what we call the firewalls for computers, how can the law prevail and make something like good for the hu humanity? Thank you. Okay, a third question on either side there. Thank you so much. My name is Joseph Maila. I'm an academic from France. My question is to follow the issue that was raised at the previous panel concerning the weaponization of dollar. We heard from the gentleman from Russia that dollar, the dollar as a currency is considered as a common international public good. And at the same time, the doctrine of the Trump administration was to state when it comes to the sanctions against Iran that the dollar was a national currency. So nobody is allowed or authorized to use the dollar in order to go, not to abide by the sanctions that have been put by the administration. My question is very simple, and it comes to the legal side of it. I mean, do you consider, from the legal point of view, it's, if this is not a law fair, what could it be? But from the um, legal point of view, is it legal to consider that your currency, which is the universal currency, as I might say, or the world currency, is at the same time a national currency and that you could put your law and make your law prevail on not the international uh, legislation. I don't know if, if there is a legislation, but it is jeopardizing the whole trade system. Thank you so much. Okay, so Antida, I think the, maybe the, certainly the first question, maybe the second <laughs> is addressed to you. Sur l'état voyou, uh, je crois que ce n'est pas du lot faire, encore une fois, parce que je serais pour une, une définition plus stricte du lot faire. Parce que l'État voyou, déjà, ce n'est pas un argument juridique. En fait. C'est une qualification politique qui vise à euh, stigmatiser des États et à justifier éventuellement euh, l'adoption de, 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 de sanctions. Mais il n'y a pas d'argument juridique dans la qualification d'État voyou. Or, pour moi, le lot faire, c'est vraiment l'utilisation du droit et des armes juridiques, enfin des, des, des instruments juridiques pour déstabiliser euh, le, le, la partie euh, adverse. Michael, do you want to answer the, 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 the second question, maybe about uh, protection of or, or who, anybody else? No? Or, or Antida? Or? No? <laughs> euh, je ne sais pas répondre à la question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question sans réponse. The people, first of all, when you asked about lawyers, I mean, if the world has to depend on lawyers 
to solve our problems is certainly in not in great shape. But let me talk about the dollar because it's obviously a neuralgic issue. A number of people have asked about it. I, I see uh, Mr. Trichet here who's done so much for the European Central Bank to create uh, a viable euro. And I was in, ambassador to the EU in the Clinton administration when the euro was just about to get started. So we have done things during the Clinton administration that were multilateral and that not, did not abuse our power. For example, we created, and it still exists, a, a, a global system for dealing with anti-money laundering. We had a common agreement, know your customer, all of these things were agreed to. We even listed a number of countries, including Israel and Russia and Liechtenstein, that did not meet those standards. Uh, second, if you want a great example of the dollar versus the euro, look at what's happened since the US unilaterally pulled out of the JCPOA. The European Union, and rightly so, wanted to keep Iran in that agreement. They tried to come up with alternative financing mechanisms so that there could be trade with Iran and Iran would get some of the benefits of the JCPOA in return for having given up two-thirds of their centrifuges, their heavy water system, 24-7 IAEA inspection and the like. And it didn't work. And it didn't work because any multinational company, even a Europe-based company, has to do business with the United States. It's the biggest market. And if the US, and I wish we hadn't done it, pulled out and said, we're going to sanction you if you do business with Iran, Europe was powerless to counteract that, even though it's a 500 million people market, larger than ours. We have 325 million. But the euro, with all the advances it's made under Mr. Trichet and, and, and under his successor who, who saved it, uh, uh, Draghi, it's not a global currency. It's not an alternative currency. And so there's no country, in the, uh, no company in the world, if given the choice between doing business with Iran and doing business with the US, it's a no-brainer. And that's why this agreement is falling apart. I mean, you talk about global governance, my God. We had a situation, it wasn't perfect, it was not a perfect agreement. There were sunset problems and so forth. Okay, we could have built on that. Now, in retaliation, Iran is restarting its centrifuges. It's talking about going back to its heavy water plant. It's enriching uranium up to a dangerous level when it was at a very low level, it's a catastrophe in terms of any kind of international governance. But it's undergirded by the strength of the dollar, by the strength of the dollar. And so Trump can get away with it because no company, again, is going to choose to do business with Iran and hope that the, e the EU's alternative finance mechanism works. It won't. It's a shame, but that's the reality of it. Oh, just, just one to answer the, the technical question uh, there. Uh, th there's often a misconception that the whole, the sole uh, ground for jurisdiction is the use of the dollar or of the U.S. financial system. But most of the time, there are other grounds for jurisdiction. If you take the, the famous BNP case, if you have a U.S. banking license, whether you use the dollar or the euro, you're subject to US jurisdiction. That's, that's the legal answer. So it's not all about the dollar. There are other, uh, of course, as I said, in the current Iranian section, there's a big split of foreign policy between Europe and the United States, which makes the sanction very you know, unacceptable. But in areas where there is a common ground, the, the, the legal ground are not only about the use of the dollar, but people often forget that. Uh, so just in the, the economic power of the US, look, look against South Korea was used by this administration to get a better deal for agriculture, okay? It was used against Mexico and against Canada, our two great neighbors, to get a better deal on NAFTA. It's been used against China to our detriment as well, but to get a better deal, and there'll be some deal, current Trump, Trump will call it the best deal ever. It won't be, but okay. So the, the, the power of the U.S. economy has to be used very delicately, but it's, when it's used with a bludgeon, which is what's being used now, 
it does produce some results, but with terrible after effects and aftershocks that will be years in, in, in recreating and going back to a rules based system. Think, I think Jean-Claude Trichet had a question or a comment? Or? Thank you very much indeed. No, I only wanted to echo what you just said, uh, both, both of you. I think when I uh, ask the major European multinationals, it is not because they are bound to have transaction with the Iran in dollars. They could do that in other currencies. And of course, the euro exists. And uh, as a matter of global transactions, the rapport de force, if I may, is not uh, dramatic. I mean, it's 45% for the dollar. 34 for the euro, something like that. The problem is, as you said, they have interest, other interest in the US, and if they don't respect the legislation and the sanctions, then they are punished, not because they are utilizing the dollar, but because they have a lot, of course, of trade or interest or FDI in the United States. And that explains, in my observation, why immediately the major European multinationals said, no, forget about it, uh, about us. And so the, the special purpose vehicle was not utilized, at least by them, which was some kind of, uh, of nice barter utilizing the euro. But again, the, the main problem is that legislation in the US, it seems to me, is perceived by the multinational is really, really overwhelmingly threatening. I mean, the okay. use of secondary sanctions, I'll give you a perfect example of how Two administrations can differ. So when I was under Secretary of State in the Clinton administration, I negotiated with the European Union on the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, which was a secondary sanction. That is to say, not against U.S. companies alone, but against European companies who were doing business with Iran or under Helms Burton doing business with Cuba. It was perfectly legal under European law and not under ours, and we tried to enforce it with secondary sanctions. But I negotiated waivers in both cases with the European companies, so we didn't have to actually use those sanctions, and we got in return things like a commitment in terms of investment in Cuba. Okay, you can invest, but do more to promote democracy and reach out to democratic groups. Okay, you can invest in Iran, but don't do dual-use products. So, I mean, there are ways to handle these secondary sanctions in sensible ways, but when we have a situation as we have today where there are sort of no limits then you really get a very, very significant problem in the whole global governance system. We're going to take one or two last questions. Jean-Claude Ruffard. On just, uh, I was for many years a French banker in the United States, and then I became an American banker in Europe. So I've come across many of the situations that you were talking about. Uh, and in the case of BNP, uh, one thing that people don't always understand BNP was warned by the Department of Financial Services in New York, not the Fed, not the administration, the Department of Financial Services, which is under the governor of the state of New York, Andrew Cuomo, was warned that they were doing transactions that were not confirmed to US legislation. It was done out of Paribas, BNP Paribas in Switzerland. So they went to Switzerland and told them, don't do this transaction, they are not confirmed to. What they did, they continued doing this transaction. And effectively, that was a payment that was for Sudan, oil export to Sudan. And that, that was done using uh, two banks, BNP and another bank, that were not American banks. And to make sure that they didn't go through, the, they thought they wouldn't go through the financial system in the US, they used the BNP branch in New York to clear the transaction. As you know, if you make a dollar payment, every dollar payment clears by 8 p.m. New York Times in New York through the Fed system. So these transactions were in the US financial system. Regardless of the way they were structured, they mm -hmm. ended up being in the US financial system and clear to the Fed. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Fed imposed, and, and the sanction, the financial sanction was $9 billion, as you know. One third of it went to the Department of Justice, one third went to the Department of Financial Services, and one third went to the Fed. So, so, so is there, I agree. Yeah. Let, let me, this is really an important point. Let, let me just make, it's really important to understand this. Whatever one thinks about the JCPOA, the nuclear deal with Iran, and again, 
it's imperfect, it's much better than the alternative. But whatever one thinks about it, it is unmistakable that the reason Iran came back to the negotiating table and agreed to the JCPOA was not because of our unilateral sanctions. It was because we got our allies in Europe to join with us who were also concerned about Iran's nuclear plan. And what did they do? Europe gave up 16% of all of its energy imports. It stopped importing all the oil from Iran. It agreed on the SWIFT system in Brussels that they wouldn't clear transactions. They agreed with us to sanction the Central Bank of Iran, Mr. Truchet, the Central Bank of Iran. If, if we had done that alone, it wouldn't have worked. So here we pull out of an agreement that the European Union sweated bullets to help us get. And now they're trying desperately to hang on to it and don't have the financial wherewithal to do it. It's really a tragedy. And it's not a way to treat your allies who sacrificed for us. You know, President Trump just said when we, when he, talking about unilateral actions, when we decided we were getting out of Syria and Turkey comes in, and he said about the Kurds who lost 20,000 men fighting with us against ISIS, where were they in Normandy? Bien, on m'a donné instruction de clore le débat. Je crois que notre hôte du dîner est ponctuel, comme l'a rappelé Thierry de Montbrial ce matin. Donc je, je vous remercie tous de, de vos interventions, de vos questions, et j'espère que... Voilà.